The options are endless, but we don't allow them to be endless. And I think our clients really appreciate the fact that they're not out there in the world with every option possible. It took a little bit, like a couple of weeks, and I was like, oh yeah, she literally took like, made this yeah. gonna work out great. Ultimately, you saw something in me I didn't see in myself, and that was always just asking myself, how can I add value to other people? <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome to the Barndo Show. I'm your host, TJ Norris, and today I've got the ever lovely Miss Alicia Fields, who is our director of sales. What's up, Alicia? What's up? What's up? I'm glad to be here. So, uh, Alicia is like runs everything from a sales perspective and keeps everything moving. And you're the every, you're like everything I'm not to that side of the division. But you started with us in our Somerville location. You still office in the Somerville location. Um, but yeah, just let's just do like a brief story, like how you got here and what you do now and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. So um, I got unknowingly recruited, um, but starting in Barndo, basically you called me up one day. You were like, hey, we're moving into the Somerville market. I need somebody to break out here, get started, who do you know? And of course, I think you already knew. I, I was going to say, definitely me. Um, I was I, super. I did not think that. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was super excited about doing it, though. Barndo is awesome. I had sent a couple clients your way before you had called, which was awesome. Um, and so I was excited to get started, and that's how Somerville was born. Yeah, that a hundred percent is how how it started. But what was crazy? It's like you'd been in real estate how long? Nine years almost. Yeah, like nine years. You were in a successful brokerage, successful yeah. real estate career. No, you were not on the radar. Like I was like, surely she'll know someone <laughs> that'd be crazy enough to come in and, you know, try to establish a Barndo um, division in, in Somerville. And I remember I sent you, was it, I sent you a Facebook message? Yep. And uh, you were like, well, what about me? And I remember thinking, no way. Like, <laughs> no way. Like that's a lot of pressure to try to like, you know, yeah. if you came over and it didn't work out, I would feel terrible. So I think I was the one like in the hot seat on that side of the thing. But then we met and had breakfast and yeah, it was just so like a given. And like, then you realized I had just enough crazy to come over. Oh and yeah. hundred percent. It. <laughs> it, took, it took a little bit, like a couple of weeks and I was like, oh yeah, she's a lunatic, like made this yeah. work out great. But like, it was so like smooth of a transition because I was so worried about the sales aspect because what good is being there if everything's still running through that, you know, upstate office? Yeah. And, uh, like, it was just perfect timing. Like, I reached out to you, and I think you had already, like, made up your mind that you were going to pursue something new. Yep. And so it was just all kind of, like, happening at one time. And uh, that was awesome. So talk a little bit about the journey. So you came in. I hired you as a sales agent. Yep. And then, you know, the rest is kind of history. You just... Yeah, so I came in as sales, um, and I feel like I picked sales up really quick in the low country. Everybody was super excited. Everything started swirling really, really quick. Um, so we took off super fast, and at that, we realized, like, multiple markets were going to require different types of growth, um, and I had a passion for, like, getting into the design aspect of it. I wanted to build out a showroom, a design center, and so it just started going, I, I would say, uphill from there. Um, and we started getting a ton of builds. We had clients coming in from all over. Um, we had just constant interest. And so realtors were coming in. Um, they were bringing clients with them. And Somerville grew really, really quick. But I grew really, really quick too. So I just had full steam ahead, um, wanting to just dive in and add value to every aspect of Barndo I possibly could. Um, and so I was traveling back and forth between locations, spending tons of time with you. I don't know if that was good or bad, <laughs> um, but learning a ton. And it was really inspiring me to get into kind of having my hands in as much as possible at Barndo. Yeah, because I, I gave you all the tools necessary to be successful, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I just kind of like put you in a, not even an office to begin with. You, yeah. you found the office, you did the whole, mm -hmm. the whole setup. And so you kind of took the ball and ran and it just opened my eyes to it. And it, I was laughing this morning. Um, thinking about this interview because Ross and I had talked about this previously. Like when I hired you, I remember 
I asked you, like, what do you consider to be strengths? And, you know, what are weaknesses? What are likes and dislikes? And you're like, look, I'm a salesperson through and through. I'm good at this. I'm not a manager. I don't want to manage people. I, that's not in my repertoire. So if that's what you're looking for, I'm not the right fit kind of thing. And so then you came and like three months later, you were the director of sales. Yep. So talk a little bit more about that. Like, you know, it, I mean, you kind of just stepped into it naturally. Like you did, you were already doing it. I think so. Um, when we started building out design centers, we realized really quickly that we wanted to have a really structured approach to design center where clients could come in and they could make it a one-stop shop. They could pick all their finishes. You know, they're not running around town loosey goosey looking for, you know, faucets and fixtures and tile. And so I kind of stepped in. I think that was really the first step I took in the direction of director of sales was really just narrowing down, like, how can we one-stop shop this whole process? Um, and then it just kind of evolved from there. I found myself kind of helping other members of the team, um, you know, getting their feedback, basically doing all the things that managers do. Um, and it was natural and it was something I'd, I'd, I think ultimately you saw something in me I didn't see in myself. And that was always just asking myself, how can I add value to other people? Um, Cause I can get the process, you know, streamlined on my end of things. And I had everything structured the way I thought it would would be best sharing it with other people. I think that was really my hesitation and it did come really naturally. Yeah. So you added the feminine touch. I did. And so I remember you would ask me all these questions. I'm like, nobody cares about that. And you're like, everybody cares <laughs> everybody about this does. DJ. Yes. Everybody cares about this. And, and so, you know, one of the obstacles we had was we were like geared up to do 10, 15 barns. And now all of a sudden we're in a multi location with hundreds of barns coming through and like, you know, you kind of attack that head on and it's like, the only way this gets better is we have to have this kind of process and this streamlined thing. And like, I would dictate some of that stuff, but like you would come in and build the SOPs and the playbook behind me. And so it was just like this natural flow to where everything I said, you were kind of documenting and creating all the stuff. And so like you're coming in, you know, and the couple of people that were on the sales team prior to you, was a big hurdle of like really just having to figure it out. Like, and I, you know, my, my blessing and a flaw is I give direction, not instruction, um, which is really good because it gives you the ability to, to make decisions and empower you inside of your position. But it also kind of says, where do I start? And so you kind of started building some of those fundamental blocks and I could just see the look of relief on everyone's face. Like when they were like, Oh, thank God. Like somebody wrote it down. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. There is. And there is an answer to this question. It's not, well, yeah, whatever they want, you know? And so, yes. Um, and, and, and really it was a huge service to the consumer because it's a lot to think about every aspect of that build. Like here's what they know. They want to be in the country. They want to build a barn dominium. They want it to have so many bedrooms and so many feet and, things like that. But like, they're not thinking the intricate levels of like, what, what kind of faucets do I want? And because, you know, like if I, if we plummet with this and then what are the options here and how does all that work together and, you know, lighting and how that lighting complement that. And then how does that tie into my hardware and all these different things? And then how does the floor, you know, like, I don't think that way. You know, it's very much like here is what we're doing. We're building you a house. All that's on you. And so the consumer's like drowning with decisions. And then you came in and like outlined it. And we're like, look, if you want to be in this ballpark of pricing, here's your options. And it just it revolutionized the way we do business. Yeah. And it was super fun, too, to realize that you could be assisting the client in some other areas, too, like talking to them the first time about how you're going to use your Barndo. And for some people, space and square footage was really important. The design aspect may be a little less important, but then you had those clients where Christmas is like the best part of their ent entire year. Um, and so coming in and saying, well, maybe we should add a couple extra outlets in the ceilings here, here, and here, and you can easily hook up your Christmas lights. And so really diving in and talking to clients about all of those um, specifics and then seeing it come to life in a way that they're going to use it season by season, day by day, year by year, um, is, is that's probably one of the most fun aspects of it. But you're right. Thinking about all those little details, clients come in and they're like barely remembering they're going to need, you know, exterior doors and, and how their husband's favorite color of siding is going to correlate with the countertop they want. And those are all things that we help with um, throughout the process. Yeah, sure. So talk a little bit about, you know, if, if you're a consumer and you're, you're kind of 
watching this and kind of trying to dig in from that aspect of like when I come into the Barn Doco and I, my first engagement's likely going to be with a marketing member or a sales member, but sales is kind of the first milestone um, when you have that conversation about what that looks like. So like take someone through a client journey, right? So I'm, I've set up, I filled out that contact form. I got the email saying that I've got a call scheduled. Walk someone through what that process would look like from that moment until say like financing. Yeah. So typically you're going to find us word of mouth online. Like you said, fill out the contact form. You're going to run into one of our first impressions people. They'll help you, you know, get set up with a in point in person appointment um, or an onboarding call. We call it a discovery call. So you're going to schedule your discovery call. You're going to be assigned to one of our many great sales agents in a location closest to you. Um, and when you get on that call, it typically lasts anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. And the call is about you as the consumer. It's about answering your questions. It's about easing your concerns and fears. Um, it's about giving you a step-by-step uh, basically guidebook based on what you're needing and what you're looking for. So if you're finance, that conversation might go a little different than if you're cash. But we're going to talk about um, all your wants and needs list. We're going to talk about size and square footage, bedrooms. Um, do you own land? If you do, you know, does it need any improvements? Things like that. Um, and so once you get done with that discovery call, ideally, we have gotten to know each other. We've built a level of trust between one another. Um, and ultimately, you're ready to onboard with us. And onboarding is essentially the process of of coming on board, paying your onboarding fee, which encompasses a ton of really great um, things that we offer during the onboarding process. So design is encompassed in that. And we do in-house design um, to make sure that your design reflects the way that we build. It it alleviates a ton of problems during the construction process when you build a barn dough. Um, and we'll go through design. Uh, we also spec with you so you can pick all of your finishes. We walk you through and again, that's that's all in-house. So we've created all these really great design centers um, in a location nearest you. So you can come in. It's really relaxed. Um, we spend a ton of time one-on-one -on -one with you. And then um, we give you a formal proposal. It encompasses all the costs that you're going to incur when building. We talk about a lot of costs that you as the consumer probably have not thought of. Um, and then we send you into finance. And finance, again, we've got some really great in-house lenders that we trust, that we've worked with and partnered with, that you're not going to run into some of the horror stories you hear from consumers about, you know, going halfway through the process with a lender and then, oh man, we don't build barn dominiums. We don't finance barn dominiums. So right. we've taken care of all that. We've partnered with preferred lenders. There are great incentives that are encompassed in that too. Um, and then you you get through the finance process and then we move into production. You know, like, and it, it's so much that goes into the front end where, a lot of people feel like, hey, I'm going to pay this onboarding fee and then how soon before we break ground? Mm -hmm. And so kind of leaning mm -hmm. into that, I think you did a good job like breaking down all the aspects because, again, it's a global strategy to get this, you know, accomplished. And during that process, we're laying the framework for you to build it, but we're also putting the ball in your court to whether or not you're going to choose to use us as your builder. So yep. you're still in control of that conversation all the way through the onboarding process. And our goal is that that experience – you know, presented in a way to where you elect to build with us. Yep. Um, you know, and we partial some of that is qualifying you as a client. So, you know, we, we're trying to make sure that we got the best fit because it's a team to get to the finish line. But timeline, I call up and I onboard. What does the timeline look like from that moment to, to getting to the, to the finance window? So, like, went through the whole thing. The proposal came back. We signed a contract. You sent it to my lender. Like, what does that – initial timeline? So it varies a little bit. If you go with one of our stock plans that are on our website, we're super familiar with, we build these in four states all over. Um, a lot of those are fan favorites. And um, so timeline, if you go that route versus completely custom, you're looking at anywhere from 30 to 90 days. And a lot of people are a little shocked by the front end time that you spend but I always tell people that front end is heavy on time, but it alleviates all the stress that most people go through when they're building custom because it's an emotional roller coaster of still making tons of selections. And there's a lot of ups and downs to the production side of it. We handle it all on the front end 
And it's really ultimately stress-free during the building process because all of your selections have been made. All of your costs are counted so for. So says the sales director. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to interview Nick and then we're going to find out how stress-free it is. But no, His stresses ahead. are a little different than mine. No, you're good. But um, <coughs> ultimately, though, that front-end process is super important because you've made a lot of the really stressful decisions that you would typically be making through an entire build process. So roughly about 90 days. Well, and, and again, this is this is an evolution of, of our own practices because, you know, in the beginning, we weren't this thorough. Right. We did not have a very thorough process of how we come in and make selections. And, and, and it's, you know, you learn from what went wrong. So you treat it case by case. And sometimes it's just a one-off. Sometimes it's a, a client, you know. But a lot of times it's just the process. And so you learn how to better communicate, better navigate, and prepare for a better you know, destination. Yep. And so in doing that, it's, it's just a, it's a constant evolution of improvement. Always growing. That's right. It's, it's always there. Like that's the staples of the core value. So, but in, in doing that, like if you come in now, a lot of people don't understand during that onboarding, during that proposal crafting, you're picking everything in your home down to the color of the walls. Yep. And so, um, there, there is a, a, a little bit of a, of a, a time, deal there, but the, it's so much easier then than it is mid construction. Yep. And and it avoids the four letter word in construction change order. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you, it, we're trying to prevent that. We're trying to keep you in a fixed price agreement. Cause I mean, that's one huge benefit of how we operate it is. is we don't do a cost plus method. We don't go into it saying, Hey, look, we're going to, this is going to be close to where you are. Um, but at the end of the day, we're going to tally up the receipts and you're going to pay me this as a builder percentage. And, you know, we land where we land because at that point in time, the only person with the guarantee is the builder and the client's assuming some risk. What we like to do is assume a, a majority of that risk and offer you a fixed rate. But to do it and, and, and really be able to deliver, you have to spend time doing these it's things. It's a lot of time up front. Yeah, because yep. you don't want to get into the change order world. I mean, can you do them? I mean, yes, but is it is it a nightmare? Yes, that mm -hmm. that is where there's a breakdown. And we figured this out as we scaled and went from building a handful of barns to you know a couple handfuls of barns. And now we literally have three, four, five hundred people at a time working through this pipeline. That you 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 can't do it mid run. It needs to be planned ahead of time, right. and that everybody's on the same page. So, you know, 90 days, you're like, wow, that seems like a long time. Talk about yeah. custom, though. So, because at this point, if you go custom, we kind of put the ball back in your court because you got a lot of stuff, and it's not just so easy to get it out of your brain and on the paper, Yeah. especially with the big B word, budget, right? Yeah. And so you've got constraints and a great idea, and we have phenomenal designers, but talk about, like, the difference. So if it's 90 days with a, with a stock plan, what is kind of, you know, common when you elect to go – the, the full custom route. Yeah. So with the full custom route, I've had literally, you can come in with an idea in your head. We find a way to pull it out little by little and get it on paper. Um, and that can span from just a custom idea for your overall build, your construction plans, and then you still pick everything from the design center. So that's a little way to, you know, kind of streamline that custom. But there's also people who come in and they've got an idea on a napkin They've got no idea how to build it. They don't know where they want to start. Um, you know, they want a lot of custom finishes on the interior as well. And we partner with our vendors uh, and, and our vendors are great. We work with great vendors. And so we're able to partner with them and we're still able to get that Pinterest board out there on your designs. Um, but that process can be a little bit more lengthy. And, you know, you're talking maybe 90 to 120 days getting through design, especially if you come in and everything about your build is still stuck in your head. And so we, we work with you. We spend a ton of one-on-one -on -one time with you. The designer spends a ton of one-on-one -on -one time with you too. Um, just getting all those ideas out on paper. But the quoting process, again, being fixed rate, the quoting process up front can be really lengthy but it's super fun. I mean, creating yep. something from scratch is a lot of fun and it, it's something that's unique to you. Again, it's something that's unique to your family and it, and it has to f still function well for you. So, but again, it, it can be very time consuming. No, for sure. Yeah. I mean, we've even had some people that came in design and they're eight months in yep. 
But again, at most often is the case that they're driving that. And so yes. it's indecisiveness. So I, it, it's kind of a gauge personality. Like if you're very definitive in what you know you want and you you have the, the ability to say yes or no very quickly, it can go pretty quick. If you're one of those people who just can't, like you have no decision velocity whatsoever, I, I, I'm praying for you. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, because it, 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 it's just a – it's just a process. You're absolutely right. To get there. Um, so how involved is is sales, you know, so they go into finance and then they they kind of um, come out of the other side and, and they're handed off to production. And so, like, what what does that look like? So you built this relationship with a sales agent, you kind of went through, but then there is a handing off point, kind of like a relay race where we've run you up to this point and now we're going to hand you over to one of our project managers and our production team. And, like, that handoff, what, what – what's – the expectation there at coming out of sales, going into production. Yeah. So that process, we actually call an RSB meeting that we schedule when you come out of finance, it's ready, set, barndo, which is super exciting. I make a big deal of it when we have clients go to it. Um, first of all, I think clients are probably excited to have a new face, a new voice, yeah. a new, a new, um, you know, speed, if you will. And so they're, sometimes they're really excited to get to, to production Um, but we have built really good relationships with them and we know a lot about their families and we've gone through a lot of ups and downs with them and, you know, we've helped them through the process. But when we get ready to hand them over, we schedule that RSB meeting and it's the first time they're meeting their production team. Um, we redline any, you know, additional changes on their plans that we need to make. We make sure everybody's on the same page. Nothing has changed. Um, and then we start scheduling some in-person site meetings with them to start staking for their home um, and just nailing down all those fine tooth production details. But but it's a pretty clean handoff. So it is. Yeah. So it's kind of like everything that's encompassed in that because of the the way we do it is is handled on that front end of the spectrum. But let's, let's shift for a minute. So this, this design center concept and like you were involved in that from day one and everything that we have, we have pretty much continuity office to office to office um, the environment in which it's located may be slightly different, but the, the things that are there are pretty much replicated across the board. Now, there's some new markets we're moving into where those things, they they vary a little bit based off, you know, location and availability and, you know, like granite choices. They might be the same name, but they're slightly different, right? you know, regionally. Um, but you kind of pioneer that. So talk a little bit about that, like in terms of selections. Like one thing that I thought was really cool, um, uh, an agreement that you put together at the beginning was with our our faucets and fixtures and stuff. Uh, speak a little bit about that. And Yeah, so we partnered with Delta um, really early on in the process, and they have been an amazing vendor for us. So Delta, I mean, it's a great product. Clients absolutely love it. They have a ton of different fixture and faucet choices. So the options are endless but we don't allow them to be endless. So we have scaled them back a lot. And I think our clients really appreciate the fact that they're not out there in the world with every option possible. And that was really the point of the design center. So I love the design center. It's, it's a passion for me. Um, it is constantly evolving because, you know, over a a three to six month period, we really see what clients are coming in, what they're choosing, what they're not really choosing as much. And we're able to update those. And it is a little bit different per location. And that's just because with market changes from the coastal regions to the mountains to, you know, Tennessee is, is really rustic. Um, those, those fixtures and faucets remain the same for the most part, but flooring options, tile options, it changes a little bit with market. And that's just because people have different design tastes in those areas. Um, but we, we do offer a significant amount of choices. I feel like, um, as far as colors and styles, um, but we, we try to keep it updated. We try to keep it based off of what the consumer really wants. Um, and our relationship with Delta continues to grow, uh, and they, they support us in all of our markets, they support us when we open up a new design center, uh, when we do our spec build. So we've really enjoyed working with them. Oh, for sure. And and one thing about that is, even though like stylistically things change, we don't ever compromise that quality aspect. So like those things just roll out. And so you may have different colors or different, you know, things like that, but the quality or the the main ingredient is the same. And we're, you know, on a global thing here where every location is kind of mimicking the other ones. And so, you know, from cabinets to hardware, it's all pretty much coming from the same source. Right. It just stylistically may change depending on the region. 
Yep, you're exactly right. So another thing that that um, you know, with being the client base we have and being rural, like we encounter some crazy circumstances. Uh, we were talking like right before this started about, you know, getting on an airplane, shooting down to Georgia as we were breaking into that market and like all the stuff going around that's like there's a movie set on the lands, cows and there's things and it's like the stuff that you see being in that sales role is unlike anything in the world. <laughs> like like what it it's so much fun because being able to travel, the fact that we build in multiple states but we're still extremely present with our clients. I feel like you can't build a Barndo without kind of getting to know your client and seeing where we're going to be putting this thing. So traveling to Georgia and seeing some of the potential builds there, literally standing in the middle of a cow pasture and like, you know, the client's like, don't get too close. And you're like, I'm going to do it. Um, it was super fun. And yet, I mean, it was a previous movie set. There was still a ton of buildings and props and things like that on the property. And so I, I feel like we spent an okay amount of time talking about the build, but we spent so much time talking about how proud our clients are of their property and the history of it and what they've been able to accomplish with it. And so, um, you know, being able to see that pride in the client about where they're putting this Bardo and how much it means to them and the fact that they're choosing us to build their home or their forever home on a property that they have so much pride in is a lot of fun. But yeah, we do, we do end up in some hairy situations sometimes on some of these build sites. So yeah, there's no shortage of adventure when you pull up and you're like, is this the right place? <laughs> I remember we went and looked at a piece of property up on a mountain and we were driving around and we kept calling like, is this the right place? They're like, yeah, just, you just keep going and there's an old Pass house. the no trespassing signs. Yeah. Oh yeah. Don't pay no right attention to the no trespassing signs. And mm -hmm. like, you just, there's like a path in the woods and, you know, yeah. lo and behold, we're at an hour later, it, we're at the top of a mountain. It's up there, very yeah. top of the mountain. Yeah, but, uh, that was fun. That's crazy. And and then the cool thing of that is like how customizable the Barnuminiums can become. Like, you know, that uh, the family in Georgia had that set. Like there was some things there and they were like, we want to implement some of this into our house. And so like, again, that puts you into a different bracket when you yeah. go full custom. So, you know, our 90% our of what we do, is a semi-custom, you know, offering. And and so that's, that's again, it's driven by budget. But some people have these, like, really unique things to where maybe their budget, you know, allows for some of these things and the stuff. There's no shortage of ideas. Like, people come to us with the most out-of-the-world ideas of, like, how to make their home unique. Yep. And uh, so that's, it's always fun to do. Another thing I want to talk about is as much as, like, we build all around – is we've done something that a, a lot of people in the space haven't done, which is develop communities and start doing some of these Barnuminium neighborhoods. Um, and we've kind of got a unique platform how we're doing it with these low-impact developments to where we're coming in and building subdivisions, but we have like minimum lot sizes. I think the smallest one I've seen is like an acre and a half or two acres, you know, it and is. then as much as 12, 15, 20-acre lots on some of these developments we're doing. Um, and being able to bring that in, like speak a little bit about that. Cause it kind of started in the Somerville location and you championed the first, you know, connection there and like how we've done it and what's available now. Yeah. So it wasn't even a few weeks after we opened the Somerville office. Um, we found like a little tract of land I came across, uh, and one thing led to another. I ended up sitting down with the developer and I remember calling you and Ross up and I was like, Hey, so I think I just signed us up to build a Barndo neighborhood a little Barndo community. <laughs> so welcome to the low country. Um, but I was super excited about that because there's nothing cuter than a Barndo community. Like who doesn't want to live in the first successful Barndo neighborhood in South Carolina? And it was super fun. I thought it was going to be great. Um, you know, we, we do a little mix of build on your own lot in there. So you can come in, you can pick one of the lots, you can pick a plan we can build it for you. And then we mix in a little spec home too in there. So we build a couple and we resell those and we kind of spec them out the way we think the clients in that area will love. But we've got multiple communities. So in the low country, we have three or four communities now. Um, lot sizes, like you said, they range from an acre and a half to 12, 13, 14 acres. Uh, and then we just, we kind of stumble across these communities. So they pop up, the, uh, the opportunity presents itself. And then we just kind of pioneer them and, and people absolutely love it. So it gives them the opportunity to still have the community feel, still be out in the country, 
live in a barn dough. It's really the best of all the worlds. And one thing that is really great about like, especially in a new market or any market, because it's such a niche product, but like we built some and we have access full time because a lot of the time we're building on other people's property. Now, again, that we have clients that are very generous with their property and their time and they're they're so happy to be building absolutely and they just open up their properties to us like i, I mean i've got clients that we've built houses for they're living in their homes and you know this is months later they still want you to come view it and, and they're still yeah. like yeah yeah come on bring them in or they'll call me they'll text me he's like i had seven people at my house this weekend to tour it and i'm like H- did we say? he's like no 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 i found them on facebook and told them come look at my house like and it's just, it just shows the pride. I mean, yeah. they have so much pride in yeah. their property, in their house. They're so excited to be in it. And they literally, I just closed one last week and he goes, just to let you know, if you still have people that want to come through, bring mm-hmm. them on. I'd love to see. And I'm like, you just moved in. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I, you'll change your mind. Of it. <laughs> like, but no, it, but there is a challenge here because some people are really private and mm-hmm. you know, like they don't want photos of their home. And so you have to kind of cater to both, but um, the ability of having a spec in mm-hmm. a neighborhood I control that thing. Yes. I don't even got to sell it if I don't want to. Yep. And so it kind of gives us that showroom and then people can say, oh, that's what a barn dough is. Yes. Because there's so much misconception about what that looks like and everything like that. So that you, you know, you help pioneer the whole community thing. So if you're in the market and you're thinking like, where do I get started? The easiest thing to do is connect with our team and go look Absolutely. at the developments we have going on. We have several across South Carolina. Um, you know, hopefully we'll be moving that into North Carolina, Tennessee, and, and eventually Georgia yeah. as well. But um, South Carolina, if you're planning to build here, we've got product in the upstate, the low country, all over. And um, yeah. And I mean, they have a lot of positives to the other, even large lot communities that track home builders are building in. They have extensive, extensive HOAs, covenants and restrictions. They're not low impact. Um, it, it's expensive to live there and the land gets more expensive as the impact gets higher and higher. So ours are low impact, um, no HOA, very minimal covenants restrictions, if any you know, right. per county. Yeah, I think so that's only, great. The only development we have that has that Joey Niles River Bend, yep. that's just because it's part of this entire sportsman's resort. Huge, yeah. Know? So like there's just a little bit of stuff in there about what, what can and can't happen there because of the, you know, they've got all the outdoor recreation stuff across the yeah. street. And so it's, um, um, but apart from that, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's unrestricted living. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's great. Well, Hopefully this helped you if you're out there and you're thinking about like, how do I connect with these guys and what do I do? You know, it's not just dudes with beards. We, we, we have a feminine <laughs> touch as well that we comes do. in and, and caters to that side of things. And, um, you know, the best way to contact us is go to our website, thebarndo.com, thebarndoco.com, um, slash contact. Or if you just go to thebarndoco.com and click the contact um, option up in the top right corner, it'll take you to the form And just complete that form. And when you do, it goes into a system. And like she said, it's going to sort through. And one of our First Impressions team members may reach out to you. You may get an automatic prompt back to book. But it's going to try to take your information and direct you to the closest available option to where you live just for a convenience factor. Um, You know, we get flooded with phone calls. We get flooded with people wanting to walk in and, like, Unfortunately, unless we hired 300 people to answer phones all day, there's no way to touch everybody effectively. Um, so, you know, we really push people to go through the website. But now is the fun part. It's time for the Barn Doe Show Barn Burner. So, we got Miss Jenna is going to drop us some questions straight from Facebook. And we're just going to be put on the spot and have to answer Let's them. So, I'm just going to defer to you. Let's, <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right, so the first question we have is, when building near the coast, what can you expect? A lot of sun. A lot of (laughs) (laughs) You bring up a good point because what you can expect is some different codes and restrictions as far as high winds. So a lot of people come to us and they're like, what can I expect building near the coast? Um, You can expect to have a few changes in some of the construction aspects of your build. There are some high wind requirements that we have to take into account. I think we've nailed that down though. And and we walk clients through pretty quickly on the front end, just based on their code and county requirements. So it can be a little bit more expensive to build near the coast. Um, it also depends, you know, if you come to us and you need to build on stilts, we'll have a lengthier conversation <laughs> about yeah. that. But um, yeah, yeah, I the, mean, the biggest we've thing got is, a process in place for that. Is wind. And so yep. one of the things is like our, our standard steel trusses that we use are, are rated for 135 mile an hour winds, mm-hmm. which is way above yes. what's required 
in 90% of the country. But as you get into some of these coastal regions, you, you get into some high wind low stuff. So we do have 170 mile an hour rated wind mm-hmm. trusses. Um, and so uh, we just step you up to stage two. It's it's really not a huge cost differentiator, but there are other things that go into that with like, you know, hurricane rated windows and, yep. and different options for that. Like you could do the window or you could do the cladding or you could, there's, yep. there's a multitude of ways to arrive at that final product. Absolutely. And then the biggest thing, and this is something that we learned the hard way, soil. Yes. Foundations. So there's there's definitely more than one way to arrive at the final product. And again, budget will drive that. But you may be building elevated slab. Yeah. Um, or you may be putting in an engineer type septic with some kind of pump because that's the that's the hardest part is the shallowness of the soils for septic. Again, we're building predominantly rural. And so getting the the flow rate um for, you know, waste. That's yep. That's a, the that's, good thing is we know about it, we're prepared for it, and we can prepare you for it. Yep. That's great. Thank you. Uh, another question we have from someone in our Barn Dominium Designs and Layouts groups, an anonymous member asks, I know Barn Dominiums are usually big and extravagant, but has anyone went small, like cabin size? About two bedrooms, one bath, a hundred square, or, sorry, a thousand square feet or less. I'm wondering about the costs, layout, companies, and pictures possibly, and just any tips and ideas, really. Oh, man. I call those our barn galows, baby barns. We love our baby barns, and we've got a ton of plans on our website that you can look through that encompass just that. Two bed, one bath, two bed, two bath. I've got three of them in the low country right now that you could tour and walk through, but those plans are super fun. Um, I absolutely love them. And as far as cost goes, we walk you through the cost just like any of the other process. Um, but I think we've got the baby barns down pat. Yeah. And they, they per square foot, they tend to be a little higher because you've got less square footage to extend like your kitchen and bath cost over. Um, but they're very popular and we're seeing more and more of it, especially as the interest rates tick up, you know, um, it's all about the most bang for my buck so I can keep payments where payments need to be. And so we've done a lot of them and we've even built some bridges between like our, some of our more standard sizes and the, and the baby barn, the barn glow series to like the cottonwood, the cottonwood's yep. beautiful, 1600 square foot, three bed, two bath. You know, it's a, it's a fire sale right now. Everybody's building cottonwoods. Um, the Hopeland's very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, the Berkeley barn, there's, there's several on the website where you can, you can get in there and, and kind of explore what that looks like, but no, for sure. You can build small. I would say this though. Smaller than a thousand square foot doesn't make sense because right. if you built eight hundred or a thousand, your cost is going to be the same. Um, yeah, a thousand is really the bottom. I think we have the elderberries like nine hundred and ninety foot or something like that, but like it's yeah. just because it's super modern and got a weird yeah. l- layout to it. But the um, that that's kind of your threshold. Like if you want to build tiny barn, a thousand is a tiny barn. It, you know, tiny home world. That's not where we live. Right. And I know a lot of people ask about additional dwelling units. How can these be used for that? Well, the, originally the first, if you go to our website, the Spruce, the Spruce was originally designed as an ADU, right? Uh, and so then it would just like the people that helped design it didn't even build it. And then it rolled over. And the first one we built was a lake house. And so um, we built it out on uh, Lake Murray um, and it just went crazy and people build it all the time. And so now like, um, we just finished one up in, in Davis in North Carolina, which was our maple plan, which is like the, the hottest plan we got. Yep. And they built a spruce as an ADU. And so we see it all the time. People say, Hey, I want to build this and add a spruce to it. Um, and so the spruce in the beginning was kind of the, the go-to for that, uh, you know, ADU because it's a very simple roof line and right. You know, it, it has all the bells and whistles that you're looking for. Well, cool. Thanks guys. That's all the questions we have today. All right. Awesome. Well, if, uh, people are trying to reach us online, obviously the contact form is the best way to get there. But like when they get handed over to their sales agent, you know, what's, what's the best way in in that world for them to, to stay in touch with their specific person. And like, if they, if they encounter an obstacle, you know, something like that, and they're just trying to figure out like, how do I get plugged in to a sales agent? We know that's contact form. But once I've talked to one, how do I get back in touch with them? 
Is it email? How, what's the best way to, to get back? So once their agent makes that initial connection with them, they'll have all the contact information, email, phone number, office line to be able to get back in touch with them throughout the process. So they're going to get really close really fast and there shouldn't be any um, issues with communication once they make that first connection. And one of the cool things about the, uh, the CRM that we use is you can actually even text you can directly into your salesperson and, and it'll, it'll, they'll receive it as a text on their phone, but also as an email. So yep. if you communicate through that, like it, you're hitting them on multiple platforms all at one time and Correct. it's really easy for them to get back in touch with you. Yep. Well, Alicia, you're awesome. Thank and, you. And uh, I appreciate you coming on here and letting people fi find out that you do exist and, you know, it's not just the TJ and Ross show. That's right. You know, we started it, but you guys have helped make it what it is today. So thankful for you. And, uh, that's all we got. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for tuning in to the Barndo Show podcast. If you're watching on YouTube or wherever you're listening to this content, uh, hit subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And then be sure to check us out on all of our social media platforms at The Barndo Co. Super simple to find us. And then when you're ready to dive in a little more, maybe look around some of our available floor plan options or take a look at the gallery of our work, or maybe you're ready to connect with our team and Explore what it looks like to build your dream barn You can visit us online at thebarndoco.com.